Uh, no, just a, it's just a quick one, actually. Um, just to welcome everyone to the first, I guess, virtual GitLab London meetup. Um, my name is Anthony, work at GitLab with, with John, and hope everyone is doing well in this new normal uh, and transition. Um, yeah, everyone is uh, welcome to participate today. So we look forward to hearing your questions. Um, in case anyone's forgotten what day it is, given that every day feels the same, it's uh, 21st of April, 2020. Um, so uh, it's the first one. Today's focus is Kubernetes and GitLab. We've got two great speakers, Will and Nico, who will be sharing uh, uh, with us uh, on, on some content. Uh, it was put in the event link, but just in case anyone hasn't seen it, this Zoom call is recorded. So um, this will be shared on YouTube with the private community. Any issues, just feel to click your video off, uh, uh, take it off, off, off view so we can't see you, but we'll love to see your faces. Um, so please do keep it on if you can. Um, there are two, well, there would, I guess there are two lucky winners today. So it wouldn't be a GitLab event if there weren't any winners or prizes. In terms of what the prizes are, I'm not going to announce that. That'll be Brian towards the end of the event. But in order to win, how you enter is you ask the best questions. So we have two people. Two people can win. The two best questions asked will win a prize. So the more questions you ask, the more opportunity or chance you have to win. And the, the winners will be chosen by the speakers. So um, absolutely uh, subjective in regards to <laughs> in regards to the winners chosen. And um, that's it, really. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Will, who will kick us off. Um, will, take it away. Excellent. Um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for coming. I'll, um, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, and then I can talk you through some of the exciting fun that we've already had today. So um, I think that if people also see, I don't know if we've gone over this, but there is reactions at the bottom that you can make, um, which are like a lovely little clap. Do, they, do people want to try having a, oh, Nico's gone for one. Um, that's pretty exciting. And we can also um, have the chat box open. And I think you can do chats to everyone. So if you do have questions, if you put them in the chat box, um, then that's also pretty good because it means that um, other people can answer the questions for me uh, without me having to, to, to dwell into them. And don't worry, I'm not going to add a crazy virtual background. Um, so, hi there. John's from New York City or NYC, which could be another abbreviation. I, I don't know. I think I'm right with New York City. That could, could be right. All right, so hopefully we're going to have a bit of fun. What I'm going to try and cover today um, is about uh, building, testing and storing Docker containers in GitLab. And we're going to try and get hands on with GitLab as, as quickly as I can. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, and I will go into presentation mode. So hopefully you can see my screen okay. Um, I see thumbs up, which is a good thing. It's like a visual feedback. Um, yeah, super. Um, so what I wanted to cover today was just a few bits about building, testing and storing Docker containers in GitLab and how that can be used as a really good introduction into, you know, actually both using GitLab, but also understanding some of the features uh, and powers that GitLab have to, to separate, separate us out from the other Git providers. Now, straight away, uh, I was going to have a segue into um, isn't, uh, you know, GitLab as a dev, DevOps platform. And that's what I wanted to do. But I've also been, uh, had a slight change today, which means that we had an exciting change of speaker bringing me in. And then I ran into a lovely challenge, which was uh, GitLab, GitHub status. I don't know if anyone has, has, in, has seen this in the yeah, recent moments. Yeah, GitHub is down <laughs> today. So, Literally, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that the demo works in the last uh, in the last hour. No, the demo doesn't work because it relies on GitHub to build its packages. And amazingly enough, this is not the first time that this has happened to me in the last two weeks. 
So I was also doing this with Cody packages and I've debugged this problem now for about 45 minutes to find out, oh, why are these packages not building? Turns out the packages aren't building because yeah, GitHub's down, so we can't um, pull the packages. Brilliant. Um, but th that put aside, you know, GitHub's uh, obviously changed their, their setup recently, and so they're allowing for, for more private things, which is great. And they're catching up with where GitLab was about, you know, about four years ago. So, so given them in four years, we might have GitHub Actions being as good as GitLab CI. Little shot across the bows. <laughs> okay, so when I say about GitLab being a DevOps platform, I, what I want to try and suggest is that it's it's not really a tool just to host where you have your your Git repos, but it's a lot more of a platform to enable a lot more of the jobs that we're generally running in DevOps nowadays. So, from my opinion. Um, DevOps is obsessed with process improvement, making everything code, automating things, and delivering visibility and understanding to others. In its core um, efforts to to deliver that, you know, all of the the techniques that that come afterwards, uh, that are these kind of things, you know, continuous integration and delivery, infrastructure as code and configuration management, testing release management, containers, monitoring error management, um, you know, DevSecOps and compliance. Are all parts of delivering that, you know, that that core process improvement, making everything code, being able to automate, and delivering visibility. And I really think that GitLab has, at the moment, a, a relatively unique position in that it encompasses far more of that overall vision of what I think DevOps should be delivering as a as a process or, or kind of cloud engineering as a process. Um, and that's a, a really great power. For, for the moment. Um, this is about me. I didn't want to put too much because actually I'm also the, the organizer and, and I got roped into to speaking, but I'm so passionate about it that I've managed to find time today. And when we're looking at, at GitLab CI, what I am really looking at is process-based iteration for software management. Now, whether that's software as in JavaScript and Java and writing applications in Python, or whether that's software that's configuring your infrastructure as code. Um, for me, there is no um, definition in between you know, the platforms you're running and the code that you're running on them. Um, and what we're looking at GitLab CI to do is be the, the tool to process it, to deliver the tools and the techniques for software teams to innovate. So we're actually asking people to do things inside GitLab CI. Um, you know, we're looking at being able to automate the build, test, release of software, and it's ensuring that, you know, I put here infrastructure teams, but it could be any software teams are empowered to make the right decisions um, because the process that we're asking people to go through is not in isolation. It's part of a, a whole overall process. Um, and then I'm going to talk a tiny bit about DevSecOps and, and really from, from my perspective as a, as a DevOps consultant, DevSecOps really starts to hit home where we're delivering security at our stages. So where we're actually delivering it in part of uh, our process and therefore we can embed those principles to how people are working and start to enable pro proactive rather than reactive security. Um, and that's really become you know, a, a, a real driver for people to deliver that uh, security a lot earlier and whether that's through compliance or policy as code or through other tools that are doing you know security scanning and, and application scanning and those kind of things it's all about being proactive you don't you, if possible you're making sure that your errors are tracked before they're even released okay so I wanted to get people into uh, a demo I don't know if my assumption is that people have turned up at a GitLab meetup and therefore they know lots about GitLab. Um, and I just raise, raise your hand or make some kind of mark if you haven't used GitLab a lot. Um, and that's, that's interesting. I can't really see that too much at the moment, but hopefully um, we can cover a kind of overview of what, what people are, are using themselves. So, Um, so that's that's interesting for me to see. Um, now I'm going to go gitlab.com, and I'm already logged into my my personal account, and so you can see some of the things that I'm 
I'm working on at the moment. Um, and I'm going to start up a new project. And the reason that I'm starting up this new project is really so that people can get an understanding of, of that process of delivering containers. So I've got a new project for me here and I'm going to Um, I'm going to whack it into my one of my groups. <laughs> I'm going to call it Hugo Go Go um, because it's going to be um, with Hugo, and I can make this public because you're all nice guys. So I'm creating this project, and what we've now done, we've created a project in GitLab, um, and I'm going to start uh, delivering containers on top of this um, project. So directly into the into the registry. So knowing what I already need to, to, to put in is a core part of this. And actually what I'm going to be building is, I think people should be able to see this. I make it slightly larger in case you're uh, on a smaller screen. But what we've got here is we've got uh, an image of Hugo, which is like a Go static site builder. And so this is a Docker file. Um, and then we have a YAML lint for it as well. So I'm going to whack this Docker file. Make sure it copied that. Still creating the project. Brilliant. The, the, the caveat is I can recover from this from another project. Okay, so we're going to assume that this project has already been created. Um, that's not a great advert, right? <laughs> okay, so we've got the project here. And what I'm going to start doing, I'm going to go and create a new file. And I'm going to create, uh, I'm going to create a Docker file. And we see we could create a template from the existing templates that are in here. So we've got, you know, ones around um, Golang or we could use Node or we could use PHP or Python. But I'm just going to paste in the one that I've already made. Um, so this is going to be running uh, a version of Hugo. I've created that Docker file. So I've got a Docker file inside my repository um, that looks like this. And I'm also going to put in, I'm going to add a new file, which is a, something for YAML lint. Um, this will become slightly clearer when I put the next bit in, which is the, the GitLab CI. So. So we've got YAML lint in here. And then what I'm going to put in is I'm going to start putting in my, my, my CI file. So what we have inside here, we've got, you know, various stages that we're running through for this container. Now, if I went to go for, I can go for the CI that we have um, it already as a template. And that will do, you know, a pretty good job of actually just putting up, I can do a new file. And I can make it and I can put on the template for Docker and I could actually stop there, deploy that and that will go and make me containers. I can then, all of you could then go and pull those containers down straight away. So we've now got an, an entire process in, I think that was about, about three minutes. Um, that you could go and actually make a container and make it publicly available. I don't know how many people have, have tried pushing to Docker Hub, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but this is you know, a way of linking those two together. You're not having to build anything in, in, in sync with you know, GitHub and, and Docker Hub to, to push it. We can do it entirely through GitHub. But actually, I'm not going to do this one. I'm going to use my pre-prepared one because it's actually starting to deliver a bit more value to people who are, who are using it. So, what we've got in here, you know, we can see in that we'd be building our master and this is going to push to the latest, uh, a latest tag. And then this is going to use a commit uh, reference um, as its Docker uh, tag name. But I'm going to put my one in. So actually what we're starting to do here is deliver more. So not only are we allowing, you know, we've, we've got had a lint running to, to lint our Docker file. We've got YAML lint running to lint our, uh, YAML and then enable us to do a build of our uh, build of our Docker image and we can also 
put in here a base image. So I'm using Alpine 3.11, but I could move that out for being 3.10 or if I wanted to make uh, some security things fail, I could put 3.7. Um, and then I'm also putting in that we were able to do a, a tag and we're putting in here that we're using a commit tag. So if I tagged my commit with uh, a version that's compatible with Hugo, so 0 0.69.0, which is the latest one, I would be able to build uh, a tag that's going to build, be exactly that one, providing I change this part. Hey, Will. Um, yeah. I just noticed uh, Marcin Wozniak raised their hand. So I don't know if they want to verbalize their question, but just throwing it out there in case they want to unmute and verbalize. Or you can ask was, a question. <laughs> maybe it was unintentional. Maybe he was being uh, like an evangelist in, and I was going to say uh, raising his hand to that. That's definitely the word. Um, Okay, so as we move on, we've got in down here, we've got, you know, the ability to use Trivi. Um, <laughs> we've got the ability to use Trivi, which is going to do container scanning on the, the item that we've do, just done. Um, and we also have the ability at the end, we're going to run it and, and do Hugo version. So um, this, would, this would version our file. So what we've kind of shown in this really quick overview, um, and this will take a, a couple of minutes to complete, um, is that actually what we've, what we've built is a pipeline for delivering, you know, relatively uh, improved Docker containers in 10 minutes. And I realize I, I established a couple of these things in advance, but actually I'd established them by copying and pasting stuff that I had in other uh, containers already and, and so we see it's not particularly challenging i've got a failure because yaml it's failed because i'm missing end end of file hmm. too many blank lines um but you can you will have to trust me at this and, and i'm going to kind of uh wrap this up um in a second and and i'll push this out to make sure that it does it does work um then it's, you know, something that you can go and run and do straight away. And one of the things I've actually started doing is when I don't have a container that I want to use straight away, I can go and actually just pull up one of my existing containers and put it inside other CI scripts myself. So I'm starting to build the tools and own the tools that I'm using in other places and especially to, to add extra things on. So I, I generally aim, I'll never have a, uh, a specific, um, a specific item that is added to the container when, when it starts running. I was trying to make them in, in advance. Um, okay, so that's kind of my, my really super fast overview. Now you can also see I've got uh, groups, my groups. So I've already got a bunch of containers in here. If you want a really good, uh, if you want a really good Ansible one, then you can pull out the Ansible ones from from this. And this is what I do for my existing jobs. And we've got uh, existing containers down here. So. <laughs> This starts to be able to deliver people a lot more of, of the things that, that they're going to want to use eventually, and also a lot more of the tools in a, in a really easy place to do it. So we have not left GitLab to do all of this, apart from the fact I've copied and pasted. Um, I don't know if we're going to take questions now. I don't, know, I don't think I saw any questions from the chat, but that's kind of my uh, really quick overview of, of building, improving, um, uh, containers inside GitLab. Does anyone have any questions that they have? Oh, I should check the chat at the same time. Obviously, sorry, just to interrupt. Uh, yeah. If you do want some swag this evening and you ask a really useful question, 
you potentially can win a lovely, lovely T-shirt. And also, if you do social media. That's my bit. I should have probably put in that I think uh, the hashtag we're normally using is hashtag GitLab LDN on Twitter. I don't know what hashtag we'd have for LinkedIn. You know, who's posted on LinkedIn? Come on, this is a business meeting. <laughs> um, super. So if no one's got any questions, you can obviously look to contact me uh, later or after um, during the other bits. So, so I've got a question. Okay. Um, so, so you created a Docker file, okay, and yeah. um, that was going to be um, pulling an image into it and then you added a few other layers and created an image, a customized image. Where would that image now be stored? Is it local or is it going to be? Um, so, you... No, sorry. I, I, if I show you inside some of these that, that have already um, succeeded, so the, the process has already passed for them, what it will do is you will run uh, Docker inside Docker so like that as a, as a container, um, and then you're able to, this is building Alpine. So it builds the container inside there. And then because GitLab runs a registry and you log into the registry, you can push that container back into the GitLab registry that you're running. And once that are public are available to download straight away. So you could reuse them in other GitLab CI, um, pipelines or you could just go and pull the container does that make sense yep thanks i wasn't sure who who that was speaking i don't have a uh, sunny sunny thank you very much sunny we have to track the names brian oh, sorry i won't know okay super well i will I will stop sharing and I think that we're going to seamlessly move over to uh, Nico's uh, session, which is what everyone's come for, right? You know, so we can get some of that Kubernetes, Kubernetes goodness. Yeah, so any last questions for Will before I will start? Okay, ah, maybe I should share my screen first. And now Zoom is telling me that it's not allowed to share the screen. Perfect. One second. Um. <laughs> One second. While we wait for Nico to get set up, Will, I think there's another question for you in the chat from Jorge. You're muted, Will. Muted is where I sound most intelligent. Um, yeah, so Docker and Docker works on the, the shared runners. I'm running this in GitLab on the free runners. So yeah, it, actually what you end up doing is you add it as a service that's available. So there's an idea of running services so the image itself is docker latest and then you run docker in docker as a service available to it so it's it's that kind of setup but yes it runs in shared runners on gitlab.com in your free minutes okay looks like i have to restart teams to get it running um, we'll be back in some seconds, sorry. I was going to say, if you're restarting Teams, is that not the wrong application? <laughs> I'm in Zoom. Is everyone else not in Zoom? I'm in Zoom too. I don't know how Teams works. Maybe there's an integration or something.
Yeah, I, I asked this question earlier in the chat, but um, for folks, it's, it seems like we've had a lot of folks join since the first time I asked this question. If you could just share where you're joining from, um, it's pretty interesting to see like the kind of global reach that this London GitLab uh, group is getting today. Um, feels like the London folks might be outnumbered, so maybe they want to step up and represent you know, London by sharing their location in the chat. Oh, there's some people from London. There's now that I've called them out, they're responding. <laughs> so the, there's a question in there for you, Will. Um, amongst all of the, the Londons and, and Nottinghams and, and UK UK people, there's a there's a there's a question in there for you. So from the previous GitLab webinar, I, I wasn't in that webinar, um, but um, I'm going to have to maybe rely on someone else to, to know whether Maven's registry is also supported in Community Edition. So whether you can use other registries. My expectation would be yes, um, but, but I don't know if that's a native integration and some of the native integrations are available on uh, the paid plans. I believe the GitLab Maven repository is a premium feature, um, but there are other GitLabbers on the call who may be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so that would be a premium or a silver feature. Yeah, you're correct, well. Simon. Yeah. Is Nico, I think Nico, he's off the core act. I think maybe he's reset system this is when it comes into value that i brought my mask of nico right did you expect it to be there <laughs> there oh, excellent that looks like nico so do you see my screen now yes hopefully uh, yes we perfect. do perfect uh i had to reinstall soon i don't know why um okay just let me bring up the question window and then i'm ready to start okay good so for said um okay so let's start um i will talk about some of containerized pipelines why containerized pipelines are a good idea or I, at least i think they are a good idea and how this all works with Kubernetes. So, a short intro of mine. So I'm Nico Meisenzahl, I'm Senior Cloud and DevOps Consultant at White Duck. White Duck is a small consulting development company in Southern Germany. So we are located near Munich. And normally I would have been in London this week for a conference where we decided to put up the meetup and meet in person and have some, some fun. So now everything's different. Uh, I'm back near Munich and uh, doing this remotely, but it's, it's still fun. So I'm GitLab Pyro, Microsoft MVP, Docker Community Lead. Um, so I'm working pretty much with the community and I'm completely in for Kubernetes, uh, DevOps stuff and, and cloud topics. So my agenda today, um, so just a brief introduction about GitLab and Kubernetes itself, how it works. Um, then we'll talk about containerized pipelines and why those are pretty nice. And then we talk about how you could move your pipeline workload into a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you could build container images within containerized pipelines. So container images within containers, uh, slightly different than Docker and Docker, which uh, will it but um, just providing some, some more input. And then, of course, uh, if you would like to get uh, swag, please ask questions and please ask Will, not me. Would be nice. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's get to the slides. Uh, so GitLab and Kubernetes. Um, yeah, it's a perfect fit. So you can different things between GitLab and Kubernetes. First of all, you can host, if you have a self-hosted installation, you can completely run and host it on a Kubernetes environment to share resources. Um, you can use and integrate your GitLab CI 
or your whole GitHub project with monitoring and, and tracing stack, which could be installed in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, then you have options like um, functions and serverless apps. So basically just caring about your code, just committing your code, your Node.js application, Go application, then um, commit it, and then the pipeline will run. The whole Docker file will be generated on its own. The deployment into your Kubernetes cluster uh, will be done for you. And then you have a serverless application which completely scales out from zero to undefined count of pods. Um, as you see here, um, was an example for me from uh, some weeks ago. So pretty nice uh, option with Kubernetes um, to, to easily scale out. And then last but not least, um, you have the option to run or containerize the build pipelines. And this is the main topic I would like to talk about um, today. Yeah, so why containerized pipelines? Uh, so basically, uh, containerized pipelines are, are pretty nice because of the same reasons containers are. So your processes are isolated. So container image is nothing else than an isolated um, process. So with this in place, you can run multiple pipelines next to each other and nobody is, uh, is seeing the other pipeline and you don't get any issues and so on. Um, this is the first one, so isolation. Second one, um, dependencies. So if you have complex build pipeline or deployment pipeline with any kind of um, dependencies, SDKs, um, CLIs, and other tools, and you would like to always get the tools in the version you would like to have them. So let's say you are depending on, on Java, then you would like to have a specific Java version um, in place for your build pipelines. And you only would like to change this version if you would like to change it. So if you're running on a shared runner, you might get a newer version or older version. If you have different, um, different build runners on your own, you might have some issues because I don't know, you have five machines and they all need to look the same, have all the same uh, software installed or dependencies installed. Yeah, those containers, it's just a container image. So it's, you define your requirements in the Docker file, building the container and using the container. So all your dependencies are within your build process, which is pretty nice. Um, so if you need Java, just put in Java. If you need, um, I don't know, Ansible or so, just put in Ansible. Um, and you can use it and, and um, run your pipeline in. Then of course, scalability. So with containers and Kubernetes in place, you easily can scale out even your pipeline. So it's, if your Kubernetes cluster is big enough, you can scale out um, as you need. And then a very important one, uh, immutability. So the container image is immutable. Every time you recreate in the container image or starting a new instance of your container image, um, it looks the same every time. So with this in place, you can make sure that every pipeline run looks the same or has the same dependency in place as you defined. So it doesn't matter on which of your host, host this uh, pipeline image or the pipeline job is, is uh, generated at the start, it looks the same all the time because the whole pipeline job is triggered in your container image, which is pretty nice. And those, there are no limitations. So it's working with nearly every project or with every project. And you just need to put the dependencies into your, uh, into your build image, which you're using for your, for your build job. So it doesn't matter at all. So any kind of software, any kind of uh, dependencies, Node.js, .NET Core, Go, um, for building applications or for infrastructure as code uh, or configuration things, Terraform, Ansible, and so on. So it's, everything works. You just need to build um, your own. Docker images and Docker, uh, Docker files or just use existing ones. So, um, so now we talked about container pipelines, uh, containerized pipelines, so we need to somehow run those containers. Um, normally, you can just run them with, with Docker run or um, even Docker and Docker. Um, this is a quite similar pattern. So many of the people are doing so, but it somehow has some, some issues. So if you, let's say you have a, a build, build house running your, your pipelines and would like to, to um, run um, your job in a pipeline, you can just do a, a Docker run script 
um, or Docker build and, 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 and run your scripts um, and run the container and doing things within your container um, and check that in the entry point and so on. Then you have the advantages of containers are immutable, but in this case, it's also a disadvantage. So let's think you're building an artifact, Java, not JS, doesn't matter. Um, and you're building it in your container image. And then you would like to deploy this artifact in a later step. You need to think about things like caching, artifact managing, uh, management, and so on. So it's, it somehow works and you can provide those scripts and build those scripts to get uh, your artifact from the first step to the second step or using a caching um, every time you run this pipeline step. Um, but just somehow need to build it on your own and you build, need to build your scripts and maintain your scripts on your own. And there's a slightly um, nicer option. And in this case, we are not even taking, talking about container image builds in container. So it's just running any kind of, um, of pipeline steps, building software, um, deploying software, and so on. So with that, that there's a pretty nice option. It's called the GitHub Runner Kubernetes Executor. Um, this is basically a GitHub Runner, as we know it. So it just get use our pipeline jobs and, and runs our pipeline jobs. But this one is a way of Kubernetes, um, which means it itself runs in a Kubernetes cluster and it schedules the workload of the pipelines in a Kubernetes cluster, um, which basically means it uh, integrates your CSDT with a Kubernetes cluster. And this works with any kind of Kubernetes cluster, so any cloud provider, any uh, on-premise de um, deployment works with everything. Um, but this in place, the GitHub runner itself um, is running as, a, as a, a pod or a container in a Kubernetes cluster but that it can also scale out if you need it. Um, and as already said, the pipeline jobs itself are scheduled as pods within your Kubernetes cluster. So every pipeline job is a pod um, running a Kubernetes cluster. After it's finished, it gets deleted um, and scheduled as, as needed. This in place, it's a pretty nice option to, to share your compute um, and even scale your pipelines. Um, so I have some customers using this. Um, they're just using the uh, development Kubernetes clusters to run all uh, pipeline jobs. So they do not have dedicated uh, build hosts for the pipeline. They just run it within their development um, Kubernetes clusters they already have. So it's pretty nice. Yeah, and the GitHub runner itself, you need of course, need to, to deploy it. Um, uh, two options, one click options. So click one button in the GitLab UI and you are ready. And the second one is more production ready option as you can um, also automate the deployment and configure as well as with hand scripts, as we already know it in the Kubernetes world. So with that, that there is a pretty, or some pretty nice features. So the GitHub runner, can handle all yeah, the, the advanced topics like cloning your, um, your repo, managing your cache and, and artifacts as you know it within your normal GitHub runner. So you just need to define, I would like to have caching um, this directory. I, I would like to, to store this artifact and um, the GitHub um, runner Kubernetes executor is just executing this one. Um, to get this in place, the pipeline shop itself, which is running in the container, um, has multiple stages. So we have, um, let me put in the laser. So we have, first of all, a prepare step, which creates the pod for the pipeline runner. And within the pod, it creates multiple containers. So one is your build container, which is really running the Docker image you define in your pipeline. And we have a look in the pipeline configuration later and some service containers. And those service containers are cloning your repo, um, um, copying your caching and or downloading your artifacts. And then we have a pre-built um, step, which I already said is um, doing all this stuff. Um, and then we have the build um, step. And in the build step, your actual uh, pipeline steps are executed within the Docker image you defined. And this one is, really doing the work. And after the build um, finished successfully, 
um, the post build shop then uploads or creates the caches, uploads the caches, and also uploads um, the artifacts. So, um, there are also some other um, advanced topics like you can you can define in your pipeline configuration resource limits, so you can define um, how much resources, memory, and CPU can a pipeline shop can use. Um, you can include services for any kind of build dependencies like the Docker and Docker example, uh, build it. Uh, and you can also define if you have a, a big Kubernetes cluster, you can select the nodes the runner should run workload on. So yeah, you're pretty, um, nearly all, all advanced topics or topics you know from a GitHub runner are uh, configurable within the ex Kubernetes executor. So let's have a, short demo how this is working. So first of all, I'm in a um, GitLab project. It's, it's, it's available out there, so we can just access it with the URL. And I added, uh, already added Kubernetes cluster. So in your project, you have the Kubernetes tab where you can add a Kubernetes cluster, which I already did. Um, if you did this, you get some, some basic information, so you get, um, you should get, uh, you get a little information about the health of your cluster, CPU and memory usage, and you have the option to install um, applications. So in here you can install the GitHub runner as well as different other tools just with one click into your Kubernetes cluster. Now this is one version to get the GitHub runner into your cluster. Um, second version uh, option would be to um, use the Helm chart, which got provided by GitLab. Um, in this in this repo, and here have the option to um, install the GitHub runner with Helm. So Helm is a package manager in the Kubernetes world, um, and there you have a value YAML definition file where you can, then can define any kind of settings. So you can define your GitHub URL, self-hosted URL. Um, you can define your runner tokens, and so on. You can define how many jobs. Um, should run concurrency, um, can define log level, log format, um, enable matrix, uh, and then you can define some kind of default image for your runner, um, and so on. So, um, yeah, and then you have option to configure your cache, to configure service containers um, up front, and so on. So it's pretty advanced configuration. You can enable nearly everything you need um, so in a production world, I would recommend to, to install the runner with the Helm script and then connect it to your, to your environment. So if you have the runner in place, um, we then um, can, can use it in our cluster. Um, here I added an example um, pipeline. Pretty basic one. We only have one stage and we're only doing one deployment. So we do not build anything, it's just deploying an application into our Kubernetes cluster. We're defining some variables. Um, important one is the Helm image. So we are once again using Helm to install our application and we are defining um, our image here um, for later use. So it's just a vari variable and we have a other variable which is called message um, where you can put in some, some text. Um, I will show you later. And then we have our stage um, with only one, one job. Um, first of all, we're defining a tag. Um, with this tag, I tell the pipeline to run in our Kubernetes environment because the runner has also the tag Kubernetes, um, providing some environment information, and then providing the image the pipeline job should run in. So here, just defining the name, which is an image of mine only providing the Helm CLI. Um, and then I'm overwriting the entry point script and it's some, some additional scripts and just install the application um, with the Helm command. And so I, as you may see, I do not do anything around authentication. So because the, the GitHub runner is running within Kubernetes, it also is allowed to deploy into my Kubernetes cluster. So you don't need to think about any authentication and so on. It's just working. 
So um, I already uh, run this pipeline, as you see here, and got my application. So it's just a, a hello world with um, our logo. So it's, it's free. Um, and now I would like to run the pipeline again and just change um, some, some text. So let's change the hello world. In this case, I already said it's a variable where I can define um, the value. So just run it manually. Put in the variable and say, I don't know, hello, GitLab. And before I run this, I will head over to my Kubernetes cluster. And we can have a look at our running containers. So doesn't matter at all. This one is important. This one is our GitLab runner running in Kubernetes. Oh, let me make it a big, a little bit bigger. So this one is the actual runner waiting to get jobs and trigger pods. And now if I go back to my pipeline um, and run this pipeline, so I will directly head over to our Kubernetes cluster. We get a new container schedule. And this container is used to execute our pipeline. So it was pending, now it's creating. In some seconds, it should be running. Yeah, it's already, it's waiting for the pet pot to get pen, uh, to get running, it's still pending. Same here. Now it's running. So now my pipeline job should have been um, executed and it's already terminating. So the job is already done. Um, yeah, it's already done. Um, so we now deployed a new version of our, of our service. So we should already see it somewhere. Oh, here. So the new pod is scheduled. This one is our application pod. It's, it's up for 22 seconds now. So if I head over to our demo application and just reload, we're seeing the Hello GitLab. So pretty easy pipeline, but completely containerized running within our Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so before over any questions so far? Oh, there's many stuff. I think there's been a few questions, but I think we've uh, we've managed to answer um, oh, okay, most perfect. of them. I think if anyone hasn't had their question answered, I just uh, highlight it. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, oh, there's a question. So is the pipeline running in a pod within the same cluster the container has been deployed? Yes. So in my, my example, it's the same cluster. Oh, wait. Yeah, it's the same cluster. My pipeline, uh, my Kubernetes executor is running is also deploying to the same uh, Kubernetes cluster. But you could, of course, um, also deploy into a, a different Kubernetes cluster. But then you would need um, Either to, yeah, you need to, to add some more steps and also indicate against the different cluster and then deploy to the different cluster, um, like you would do with, with, with Helm and kubectl, um, or you just um, deploy a GitLab runner into the second cluster you would like to run the application and then the runner would, would do the authentication against, against it. Okay, so, Next one. So now we are doing containerized pipelines. So we need some more containers. Um, so every pipeline job we are using, and I already did in my example, um, we put in our binaries and our libraries and tools. So in my example, it was just Helm, um, but it could be anything, any kind of SDK, any kind of build requirements and so on and any kind of external dependencies. Um, and of course, you also should rebuild source um, because of security fixes. So I have a, a, um, a repository, you can share the link later, um, which contains, or it's basically this one in the, in the, in the project here in the pipeline. Mm 
No, this one, uh, it's just a um, GitLab repository hosting some kind of images um, which you could use. And in this example, or in this project, I'm rebuilding those images once a week, doing some security checks on it, and then publish them. So if you build your own container image, it doesn't matter if it's a pipeline image or uh, application image, rebuild them uh, to be sure to have all security uh, fixes in. And of course, you should also define a fixed version in your container images. Then. Without this, you would get newer versions without knowing it. So same thing like you would do on a, on a normal runner machine. And of course, um, because containers are immutable, you need to think about caching. Um, so you need to make sure you have caching in place to be able to, to fasten your, your, your pipeline. If not, the container gets started, do not have any caching options and your pipeline runs would get, would get um, pretty slow. Okay, this is an example um, job image. Um, this one is basically uh, YAML in, so we we'll already used it uh, before. So it's based on Airpine and I just um, defined my version, my YAML in version and just used um, the packet manager of Airpine installing it. Um, and now added some entry points and CMD. So now I can run this image in my pipeline shops, just provide uh, a CMD line um, and so on. And I I'm, I'm, um, can run my, my pipeline shop. Once again, it's an easy one, but this would be an example. Um, my, my ham chart um, looks basically the same, or my the pipeline shop for my ham chart. Yeah, this demo, um, was part of my last demo, so I already did it. Um, it's just an example how you can use the um, ham, ham chart and install it. So we can skip this one. And now I would like to talk about different topic. topic. Um, uh, any questions so far? I'm just seeing lines of lines, but I think already is, everything's covered already. Huh? Yeah, okay. So just, just point out to me if, if, if there's a question open. Um, okay, so now we have our pipelines. We have our containerized pipelines. We have defined our pipeline um, images we would like to use, but we somehow still need a, a solution to build container images in our Kubernetes cluster. So basically co building container images in containers. Um, there's an option called Docker and Docker. Um, which were mentioned before, which basically there are different different options how Docker and Docker works, um, which basically allows you to build or access the Docker daemon within your um, container and then build um, your images, which is pretty fine if you're running on a um, on a normal machine. You might get, uh, it, it might be fine, but if you run it in a Kubernetes cluster, you get some security issues with this. So Docker and Docker either need privileged mode to really run the Docker daemon within Docker, which is not really often allowed in Kubernetes clusters or shouldn't be allowed in Kubernetes clusters. And, or you just mounting um, your valid Docker directory within your container, which you get in trouble if you run multiple instances against one directory, um, or you need to expose your Docker daemon socket, which is also a security issue. So on a machine just running Docker, it's totally fine to use Docker and Docker in, in build jobs, but within Kubernetes, within a Kubernetes cluster, most of the things will not work because of security reasons, or at least should not work because of security reasons. So you need to find, um, another other option to to run it and uh, with this um i would like to talk about canico so canico is an open source project by google which allows you to build container images within containers without the need of any privileges or dependencies so you don't need docker daemon to uh, to build the images so it's just a container without any privileges and so on so I like the, the Docker image here. So it's just a binary running in a container image. It's pretty easy to use. Um, we will talk about it in, in a second. And once again, because also Kaneko is running in a container, you need to think about caching uh, to speed up your pipelines. 
And Kaneko offers two ways of caching. So first of all, you can cache your layers. So if you build your Docker, uh, Docker image based on Docker file, you have different layers. It's those layers um, can be pushed to a registry. It could be the registry, your final image gets pushed to, but it could also be a different um, registry. And then every time Kaneko uh, builds your Docker images, it knows, ah, okay, there's a, a image layer in my registry uh, I can use, and then it just pulls the image uh, layer instead of rebuilding it. Um, now, this is the first option to get the build faster, and the second option is to um, also uh, cache the base images. So basically, those images you define in the Docker file in the from from line, and and those images can be cached um, with the volume or um, in the file system. And for a container, it's file system is not a good idea. So this one could uh, could be cached with with the GitHub cache option. Um, with the runner, so with this two in place, you nearly get the same uh, same performance as um, as in normal normal builds. Um, just an example how Kaneko works. So in this case, we are just running a pod, um, defining a name, defining a name, um, defining a container with the container image, the Kaneko image, and then providing some arguments. We need to define where the Docker file is located. Um, we need to define the context root of the project, so the folder the Docker file is in, and we can can define a destination. So if we skip the destination, we're just doing a build. If we would like to test the build with the destination, we doing a push after the build um, has finished. We can also define multiple destinations if we would like to push multiple takes or the image to multiple um, Docker registries. So. Once again, a short demo. So now we have um, a small retro, a small project. Um, once again, a small Docker file. This one is basically the Docker file I used in my first demo. So it's providing help. Um, it's based on another Docker file of mine, um, kubectl, which is dependency for Helm. Um, and then I'm using um, Packet Manager to install my, my, my Helm, um, defining the entry point, um, defining CMD line to be able to just um, call Helm straight away. Um, this is the Docker file. And of course, this one is easy one, but of course, also multi-stage uh, Docker files would also work with this. This is um, the sample pipeline, once again, pretty easy. One stage, uh, we define one variable. Um, this one is the Kaneko image tag we would like to use. Well, this one here, um, it's important. This one needs to be de debugged at the moment because the, let's say, normal Kaneko image does not include a, uh, does not include a shell. So your scripts in line 15 to, to 21 wouldn't work. So you would don't need the debug image. It's a little bit bigger than normal one, but doesn't matter. Um, since some weeks, the Kaneko project also provides uh, versioned uh, debug images. So if you just use debug, you will get the latest one, but there are also um, versioned ones available. So once again, we're defining the tag to tell GitLab to execute this in our Kubernetes cluster. We are defining the Kaneko image and we would like to run in. And then we have two lines of before scripts. So those are just uh, those are needed to authenticate with uh, a registry. So to be able to push the image after we build it. In this case, we are pushing it to the registry attached to our project here. So we have our package container registry here, um, which is pretty easy. So we just um, can use predefined variables. And do not think about any any um, any names on authentication. So this one provides the URL to the registry. Then we provide a username, which is our GitLab CI token, and then we're providing a password, which is our CI job token. So those are only valid, or this is only valid in this job. So it's pretty secure, and um, save it into a file. And with this, Kaneko is able to um, to push it into our registry. And then we have the actually build scripts. 
So we are calling the Kanika executor, providing a context. Once again, it's our CIA project directory uh, variable. Define the Docker file location, it's in the root, so it's just the Docker file, and then provide the destination. In this case, once again, the registry attached to our project with the image name and the image tag. In this case, we just use latest, but we can also use um, uh, a shortened um, hash of our commit um, or something else. So, and if we now run this pipeline, once again, if I get to the my Kubernetes cluster and I'm fast enough, yeah, the job container image is creating and it's running. So now the job should already run. Yeah, it does. And then Kaniko, uh, it needs some seconds, but it should work pretty fast. Hello. Ah, here we go. So the output is pretty similar to um, Docker build. So it's just installing all the stuff, running um, the different lines from our Docker file, taking a snapshot, um, defining the entry points, CMD, um, everything I already defined, and the job is already done. So if we go back to Kubernetes, the job pod got terminated already. So it's, it's already um, deleted from our cluster. And if we now go to the container registry, um, we see the helm image and it got pushed 30, 40 seconds ago. So it's um, a new image, which is now available in our container registry. We can use it for our pipelines or for anything else. Yes, so this was my talk so far. Any questions? Or any open questions? So I don't know, Will, John, Anthony? It it's looks like there's, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. So let me check. It might be easier to just ask folks to verbalize their questions because there was a lot of back and forth in the chat. I'm not sure how many of the questions are still unanswered or people are looking for further clarification. Does anyone want to verbalize a question? You can just unmute and ask Nico. Sure, I can hop in and verbalize my question. Uh, yeah, it looks like someone else in the chat has a similar question. So, Nico, I, I guess I'm wondering, it, it's a little bit tangential to your talk, but I'm wondering about the process for getting artifacts into the Kubernetes job containers. Because um, you mentioned that there's a service container that pulls the artifacts, uh, but I also know that GitLab is pushing more the ability to use like Maven or Conan. And like as part of our pipelines, we build a variety of like test binaries and uh, like actual software binaries that we'd like to deploy. And it would be really nice to kind of distribute all of those artifacts into a number of Kubernetes jobs uh, that can then test one thing very specifically. So I'm wondering what the process is generally for, for getting artifacts into those containers. Okay, so it, so it depends. If you use the artifact function in GitLab CI, then you can define the artifacts within your pipeline configuration. And those get automatically um, downloaded into the pipeline container. Um, if you use some external um, artifact management tools, you will need to download them on your own like you would need to do on, on, your, on your hosted runner or on your normal runner. Um, I, 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 it depends how, how fast changing they are. So maybe you could also just download them, put them in the cache directory and use cache to get it to every pipeline shop um, or maybe also um, build them within the pipeline shop. So if it's, I don't know, changing once a year, the artifact uh, for testing purpose, you can also put it in the, in the Docker file and build your pipeline image with, with the um, artifact in it. So it depends. 
but basically you have the uh, artifact option GitLab CI provides, which you can use in a containerized environment or not, and everything else um, would need to build, uh, you would need to build on your own. Yeah, that's a good overview of the strategy. Um, we'll have to figure out what makes sense for us, but thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Can't see any in the chat, but yeah, feel free to verbalize any questions you have if you did not write anything in the chat. Okay. So just for information, the slides are already available online. Um, also, the demos are completely available. Um, not only the two I showed, there are some more available on this URL. Everything's public, so just test it, try it, play with it. Cool. Okay. <laughs> was that like theme music? <laughs> oh, that was funky. Um, just a quickie. What I'll do is with the winners uh, of the prizes, I'll put the comments. In, I'll put them in the comments on the meetup page, if that's okay. That sounds great, Brian. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. In that case, I guess yeah, if, if anyone else has any questions generally about GitLab or um, in, in also wants to get involved with organizing or helping to organize some events, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can shoot me an email at aothomas at gitlab.com if you want to have a chat or just shoot us a response via the meetup group um, and we're happy to have a chat. So I guess there's no further ado, John. Um, we can call it an evening and I hope everyone stays safe and see you again soon. I think the only bit that we'd add is we're probably going to look at doing a, another one sometime. Probably it's going to be June now yeah. um, of, of the London meetup. Whether we'll actually meet in person or meet in the, the glory of our own homes again, um, which certainly I'll have a lot longer hair by then as well. Um, and yeah, um, I think there's also, if you look online, I think that uh, there's a the next thing in London session tomorrow I was with about GitLab as well. Um, yes, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and I'm going to groom myself tomorrow a little bit, get the old beard shaved, you know, and the rest of it. I, I look like the Wolverine under here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking grim. Yeah, but uh, the content is really good. We're doing uh, an introduction to GitLab and all the goodies with it, um, with Michael. And uh, I'll leave a link in the meetup. Uh, and thank you, Will, for reminding me. No problem. Yeah. And um, I'd just like to say one or two quick words. One, uh, thank you for letting me crash the London meetup. It's nice to be able to participate. Um, and I love seeing all the conversation happening in the chat and people answering each other's questions. And thanks to everyone who asked all those great questions. Um, one thing our team at GitLab you know, is really proud of is our transparency. We you know, keep our issues open and people can comment on them and we love hearing feedback from the community. So for folks who are asking questions, um, whether it's about Spinnaker or some of the artifacts functionality, um, I would encourage you to you know, do a search on Google to find relevant issues, um, GitLab issues um, about those features and go and give us feedback and provide us um, some direction, let us know about the use cases that you have in mind when you're asking those questions, because that'll help us, you know, build the product in the way that the community really needs us to. Um, and then lastly, if you want to get involved with community events, I dropped my, um, you know, like email alias in the chat, evangelist at gitlab.com is the best way to get in touch. Um, and I'd love to hear from you if you're interested in speaking at a GitLab meetup, whether the, the London group or another local group or one of the ones that we're organizing um, from, you know, the GitLab side. Um, or if you just have topics you want to hear about, um, I'd love to, you know, hear about that too. And that way we make sure that the events we're putting together are relevant to the community. And thanks again um, to everyone for the participation today. Okay. <laughs> I've even got a youngster next to me. Say goodnight. Yeah, sure. Good night. <laughs>
<laughs> Take care.